Well, thank you all for coming out again today. Um, so we're continuing our series on the armor of God, which if, as I said earlier, since the beginning, we've been working through each armor piece that Paul talks about in the book of Ephesians. All throughout this series, we've been talking about this idea of standing firm. Stand firm. Because you see, there's this language that Paul is using in the book of Ephesians. And all of these pieces of armor enable us to do exactly that. Stand firm. And as we've been working through each armor piece of the Roman soldier, we've spoken on the belt, the breastplate, the boots, the shield, and of course the helmet. But what's interesting to note about each and every one of these pieces is they are actually a defensive weapon, which is great because we need truth. We need righteousness. We need peace. We need faith, salvation. But today, we're going from the defense to the offense. You see, we're talking about what do you take up when the battle ensues, when you are met with a fierce enemy in order to prepare yourself for battle. You see, when it comes to taking back territory for God's kingdom, we need an offensive weapon, which brings us to our sixth armor piece which is the sword of the spirit. Because how does one truly stand firm? They draw their sword. But why do we need a sword? Well, John 10, 10 tells us that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So here's the thing. I want to say that in no way are we looking. I gotta pull this thing off. This ain't working. <laughs> in no way are we here to give credit to the devil. You know, he is not for us to fear. A matter of fact, we are called to walk in freedom in Christ. However, it is important we understand we do have an enemy. But with that, we don't walk as defeated, we walk as victors. Because the good news is. Actually, the great news is we've actually already won the battle because Jesus has won the battle. Jesus later speaks in this same scripture where he's talking about the thief coming to only kill and destroy. He later continues to talk about this victory where he says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So let's remember that as we're putting on God's armor. Ephesians 6, verse 14. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as boots for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. Because when we take up the shield of faith that says, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, which we spoke about in our last service. And finally, the armor piece that we're going to be speaking on today. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Remember that. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. You see, this is a weapon of the spirit. And you can't really fight without the spirit. Or I suppose you could try, but you're not going to be very successful. You see, the Holy Spirit is like the life source that keeps the believer moving. Without it, it's kind of like trying to run your bike with your gas light already on. Sure, you could do it, but it ain't going to get you very far. So now, this is why... I tell people to turn their phone. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Whoever that person is, is like, oh no. So this is why understanding scripture is so important. Because actually the original language that the book of Ephesians found in the New Testament was written in, of course, was not in English. It was Greek. And in Greek, there are actually two words to describe the word when it's referring to God. Which if we're going to learn to wield this sword of the spirit, well then we should probably understand its appropriate attributes and how sharp it really is. So the first word, I'm going to give you guys a little lesson here. 
The first Greek word for the word is logos, okay? And the other being rhema. Now, logos is used to refer to the living written word of God, meaning the lit literal, like literature that is in the Bible. When we read the written word, we can learn about God and know his ways, his plans for mankind with logos, the written word. We would have no way of knowing God's purpose or our place in that purpose. You see, through, through logos, we get the gift of knowing our God objectively, which is a wonderful thing. But as I had mentioned before, when I referenced myself earlier, Oh, I'm about to lose my papers. Many of you might know me, might know of me, but there's a big difference with actually knowing someone personally. You see, getting to know someone objectively is only the start of the race. It is not the finish line. Our next step is to know God on a personal level and experience him relationally. This is where the second Greek word that describes the word of God comes in, rhema. Now, rhema is used to refer to personal speaking of God, meaning we have instant and direct access through prayer and conversation to our Lord. Because you see, our God, he listens. And believe it or not, he also talks if we quiet ourselves long enough to hear it. He continues to speak today, and he wants to speak directly to us. It's actually by his word, rhema, that we can know God in a personal way. So the way I want you to imagine this is it's like a two-edged sword. So logos is on the one side of the blade and rhema is the other. And with both, you can't, sorry, they both work hand in hand in order to be able to take this tool and not just be defensive but move to an offensive position. And now this is so important because we need to learn to speak and act on the word, what God is calling us into. Because as we know, it's not enough to just study the word, the logos, as in the Latin literature. You must also speak it. You must live it out. So we can read in our Bibles that, that even, believe it or not, the, the demons know who Jesus is. Even the demons know some of the word and they tremble at it. So that clarifies that it's much more than just studying and knowing. We see even in the story where Jesus is in the desert and the evil one is bringing out every weapon he can think of, including God's word. And his goal is in order to get Jesus to bow down in defeat. But our Lord, Jesus, has such a vast level of discernment that he's able to break that down and disarm the enemy. And in Matthew 4, it says that the enemy departs from him. So you see, there's a very real element here where we are seeing God's word used as an offensive weapon. These verses, these chapters, they aren't just historical data. It's our sword. Meaning we can receive guidance from the Holy Spirit. This is also why it's called the sword of the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, he's going to guide you. And he will guide you in truth. He will never say anything that isn't in line with the scriptures, the, the Logos word. And Jesus himself even tells the disciples this in John 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all this I have said to you. Now I want you to understand, you are in a spiritual battle, not a physical one. And that is why the Holy Spirit should help you with this spiritual battle. Because you see, if you've invited him in, then he lives inside you, in your body, which is the temple of God, and he wants to lead you, and you, follow. Now, anyone who's ever ridden in a pack, um, as you'll note, I'm in a motorcycle club, so we do that all the time. Um, but anyone who's ever ridden in a pack knows how important it is that they trust and follow their road captain. 
His job is to know the road, to point out and protect everyone from potential dangers, and get everyone safely to their destination. This is much like the Holy Spirit. You see, except this ride that we're on is called life, which means you have to trust him and let him guide your feelings, your thoughts, your plans, your desires, your whole life. And that means even when you don't see the potential hazard ahead and you're frustrated by the fact that for whatever reason, he's not allowing you to move past it, not overcome that next obstacle in front of you. You know, when I, when I first started hanging out with my club, there were multiple rides we went on where I was like, come on boys, like, let's pass this slow poke. Like, let's, let's, get it, let's get it moving. But little did I know, there was a hazard in front. And if I would have done it my way in that moment, I wouldn't have just put my own life in danger, but my brother's as well. So you see, eventually, I learned how important it was to trust the one leading the pack. You see, you have to trust that he can see things that you don't. And I promise you, friends, it's much easier to trust your road captain, in this case, the Holy Spirit, when he's someone you ride with every single day. Then if he's someone you just happen to saddle up with from time to time, allow him to lead and you to follow. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit with whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. This is also why you will grieve the Holy Spirit when you now sin against God. You see, the Holy Spirit now lives in you and will convict you when you sin against God. But see, this is very important to note that there is a big difference between something called conviction and something called condemnation. Conviction points you to God. It makes you run to him. Condemnation creates shame and it makes you run away from him. But as a follower of Christ, that conviction will drive you to the Father and you will, you will go to him because you feel guilty. And you will go to God immediately and ask him to forgive you. This is what will happen as a follower of Christ. If, if, if not, then you kind of just continue to live in your sin. But you see, this is what it means to have a real relationship with God. There's a price. Ephesians 4 verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whom, sealed, whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You know, the Holy Spirit is amazing and it's amazing that he's in us it's actually the biggest miracle that so many of us in, including myself tend to take for granted sometimes but let me explain this when you are thinking in your thoughts people can't see what you're thinking right only you know what is going on in your thoughts and so it is the same with God only the Spirit of God knows the thoughts of God. And it is only He that can reveal it to you. And He does reveal it. He reveals it through His Logos, the Scripture. When you read, when you study the Bible at first, as, as a new Christian, there, sometimes there's some things in the Bible that, that are a little bit hard to understand. And, but as you grow spiritually, the, the Holy Spirit actually begins to reveal God's truth. Of scripture to you more and more so now let's say a year or two from now you look back and and you might even say like man when I read this like a year ago I totally had no idea what it meant but I fully understand it now it's it's, it's alive I because that's the Holy Spirit in you he's, he's teaching you he's you're growing spiritually so first Corinthians first Corinthians 2 11 I don't know why that was a tongue twister for who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him so also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God see one of the most important things that you need to learn is to listen and live through the Holy Spirit 
And you need to study God's word to see what he tells you about how to live through the Holy Spirit. You need to ask him to help you to do it. We see actually a, a really great example of this found in the Old Testament in Psalm 143.10, where this is David speaking. He says, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. He leads, we follow. You see, we're in a spiritual battle every day of our life, and we have to fight the devil and his lies to be able to discern between these things. We need both the one side of the blade, which is the logos, and the other that is the ramos. You see, the lo or the ramos, sorry. The logos will help you understand the truth. But then the Holy Spirit through the Rhema will help you to understand on a personal level and how to implement it into your daily lives. Hebrews 4.12 says it this way, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit. I need a bigger thingy up here. Do you want to know the difference between your soul and your spirit? You guys got to read this thing. You really do. Study it. Know it from front to back. Put it on your heart. And actually, when we start our next service, I'm going to do a 365-day challenge. And what we're going to do is I'll have a little sign-up sheet. And all it is is three chapters a day, which in this Bible is literally one and a half pages. And in 365 days, you'll have read through the entire Bible. So if we are someone who are putting on the armor, then we better learn how to wield our sword. Second Timothy 3, 16 to 17 says, all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly Equipped. Amen. I'll read that again. Thoroughly equipped. This, this scripture right here is the whole series. All right there. Equipping each and every one of you with the armor of God. So this isn't just for you. You don't just come here to, to receive information. This isn't just for you to, to know or to study. It's, it's to be equipped in the word. To be equipped with your offensive weapon as a follower of Christ, as a son or daughter of the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, to be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, a command is only as powerful as the authority that it comes from. So we need to know that this book holds more authority than anything else that could ever exist. So when you're walking through life as a follower of Christ, we need to know that that word of God holds more authority. But... You see, it's our offensive weapon, and it holds just as much authority now as when it was first spoken or written. So we can actually begun, begun, well, sometimes I can talk. So we can actually begin to claim that authority. We can walk in that authority. We can speak into that authority. We can speak that into our life situations, into our brand new marriages, into our workplaces, into our relationships, our finances and the way we approach education. All of these things have an authority that we can stand firm on because we have the word. Because here's the thing. We live in a world where it is so easy to have the most sold book on the planet. Even every hotel room used to have one in their bedside table. It is an extremely prevalent book. But if we as individuals haven't interacted with the word of God, then how do we expect to use our sword if we barely ever pull it from its sheath? You know, a few weeks ago, my brothers took me out shooting for my bachelor party. So they brought some super cool guns and things to shoot at. But they also brought this sword that had actually been given as a really cool gift. And if I'm honest, I was a little confused. Because I saw this sword as a fun little decoration. I, I never seen it as a deadly weapon. But here's the thing. I barely pulled it from its sheath. So I didn't think it would be used to cut anything. But it wasn't until we set up some props and I took a swing did I realize how it turned 
everything in its path into butter with how smooth it would cut. And this, my friends, is like the word of God. As Hebrews says in chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is living and active and it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We need to understand that the sword of the spirit is a little bit different than the other pieces of armor of God. Because other pieces, as I said before, are there for our protection. But the sword of the spirit, it's also there to protect you, but yes, but it's also there to go on the offensive, to strike back. Because it is the sword of the spirit that gives us freedom, that gives us power and truth and spiritual life. And God speaks to us through the spirit. In John 6, verse 63, it says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. You see, we need to understand that if you have accepted Christ into your life, you are never alone. And some of us need to hear this today. You see, God is with you. The Holy Spirit is with you. He is in you. You are never alone, and he won't forsake you. It might feel like it at times. When there are difficult times in your life, but God is testing you. And he wants you to hold on to him. When you are weak, then you are strong. What the heck does that mean? It means that when, when you don't know who to call, when you don't know who to talk to, who to trust, what to do, you don't have all the exam answers, that is exactly the time you have to call on God. You go to the Holy Spirit and he will meet you there in your weakness. And he will give you the strength to overcome because his words are sharper and will cut through anything in its path. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. Man, that one hits. I, I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of times when I'm praying and, and the words just aren't even coming out. So this is so encouraging to know that like literally my tears can be words to God. He can hear you in your deep groaning. Can you read that again, Aaron? That... Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. You see, prayer is crucial in our Christian life. I mean, this is literally how every relationship works, is good communication. I'm learning as we go. <laughs> how can you have a great relationship with God if you're not speaking to him regularly? You need to talk to him. You know, right after... Paul does this whole thing about talking about all of the armor pieces. In Ephesians 6, 18, he says this, praying at all times. Not sometimes. We've gone over this. All times. Which means praying at all times, it continues in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. You know, there's there's these certain phases that, that sometimes believers go through and especially new believers, where, where they might start to, to lose their focus, where they don't keep their eyes on God anymore, and they start to focus on the world and its problems. You see, they go through this phase where, where they stop reading Scripture, they stop praying, stop going to church, and they lose their focus and just fall into the world. But of course, that only lasts for so long because suddenly things get worse and worse. And you know, there's, there's problems here because they start to stress because what they're doing is they're focusing so much on the problem instead of looking at the problem solver. If this is you, listen to this. Philippians 4, 6 to 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made. Friends, your requests can't be made if you're not talking. Right? And we need to quiet ourselves to listen. Mm -hmm. So let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses 
all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Did we get that? Good word. It means that your relationship with God determines how strong you are in Christ, how strong your faith is, and how you will react to the things of this world. And that is why people who are intentionally seeking after God, who are trying to be followers of Christ, imitators of Christ, as it says in Ephesians 4, are seeking after God, are always much stronger against the world's attacks than those who aren't. You see, the big issues for non-believers aren't big issues for true followers of Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and let me be clear, that, that in no way makes, because somehow they are better, it is purely because they have a relationship with God. It is a relationship that's been built over time by the knowledge of the word, the logos word. And the rhema having a true relationship with God. So where you not only study scripture, but you actually have it written on your hearts. But you also come to know, and this is the best part of rhema, is you come to know the beautiful tone of the Father's voice. You begin to live by scripture according to the promises of what God has said in his word and you fully begin to trust it. Because you see, it's not someone you longer just know of, but it's someone you actually know and love. Your heart, your eyes, all of these things are on him, not on the problems, the issues of this world. No, instead, when we put on the armor of God, these things tend to melt away a little bit doesn't mean they don't exist, but they don't hit you the same way. Matthew 6, verse 6, but when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who is in secret will reward you. Do we do this? And if not, then how can we start to incorporate this more and more into our daily routine? You see, it doesn't have to look exactly like this, but how often are you setting aside time between you and the Lord. We can't expect to have a great relationship with God if we're not putting in that time. You need to make him the priority. Everything else comes second. Your wife, your husband, your children, your career, your club, everything has to be second to God. Jeremiah 29, 13 says this, you will seek me and find me. And when you seek me with all your heart. So I have a challenge for you. Don't take my word for it. Interact with the word of God. Wrestle with it and see what you think. Because we are called to have a relationship with God. Not just sit at a table next to him and listen in as he's talking to his children. You see, we're called to be one of those children. His son, his daughter. And we do this by seeking him his word, his salvation, given to us by his son, Jesus, by dying on a cross for our sins. But it doesn't end there. Three days later, he's raised to life so that we can have access to a living God that wants to interact with us and us interact with him. See, that speaks to us every single day if we would just quiet ourselves enough to listen and then respond. You know, sometimes I feel like when we, when we, in our prayer life, when we go to God, it's like we literally just have this giant to-do list. And we just kind of show up and we're like, hey, God, if you can do this, 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 this. And before he can even respond, we're like, hey, got to go do the next thing. That's not a relationship. I don't know about you, but any friend who comes to you and is like trying to talk to you, but you don't even get to respond and they walk away, probably isn't going to be a friend for very long. It really shows that forgiveness that he has for us every single day. So what I want you to take after this service and, and every service in the future isn't just, well, you know, Aaron from the armory told me God said this. No. I want you to push up your sleeves, dig into the word yourself, and I want you to interact with God's word so that you know you can stand firm on solid ground of God's word being your sword. Amen. Not my sword, your sword. So that when the enemy comes, you have an offensive weapon, which is the word of God for your life. Because as it says in Psalm 1830, 
As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. And he shields all who take refuge in him. This world and everything this world can offer you cannot even begin to compare to what Jesus has. The temporary cannot compare with the eternal. Don't waste your time that God has given you. Use it to run the race as a warrior. Fight the good fight in the armor of God until he calls you home. Let him lead. You follow. Pick up your cross and follow Jesus until the end. Thank you.